<clears throat> How do we sound? Do we sound good for everyone? You can hear us great? Fantastic. OK. Now, the man sitting next to me uh, has the rare treat of being able to claim that he helped invent a music genre in the 21st century, which not that many people can say. I know you're probably going to get a little bit shy there. You're like, oh. Right. But it's very true. Um, and the fact that that, is, that has happened is completely fascinating and is going to be like the focus of our talk this afternoon. So please help me welcome Mr. R.P. Boo. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My Great. pleasure. Great. I think what we'll do to get everyone in the mindset of what we're talking about is we're probably going to play a track just to, like, to set the scene, get you in the frame of mind of this music. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play one of your very earliest tracks um, to, to start us on our journey. Okay, and this one is called a a Baby Come On. And yes. if correct me if I'm wrong, it's from 1997? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, great. This is called Baby Come On. Oops, sorry. My bad. to have to, to pick a point in that track to stop playing it, but that was um, the sound of Baby Come On, which was one of your earliest productions. And it's, it's so nice to see you enjoy your own music yes. the way that you do. Yes. It's lovely. Um, I would like to start, in that case, with the idea that every new scene and new sound has to come from an absence of something. Yes. There's a vacuum. Yes. So could you set the scene of the time that you made that track in 1997 in Chicago? And what was there, but more importantly, what was not there? OK. Um, I'm going to get to how that track got created. Yeah. That's the simple part. Um, when uh, Puffy did the... Uh, the song with Mariah Carey, Fantasy, mm -hmm. that's at the beginning with Old Dirty Bastard. And um, I was in the car one day listening to this guy on the radio station, so he was doing a live mix, um, recorded, but he was actually using, because vinyl was still tough at that time in the States. And I was listening to him play the beginning intro. And it got to the part, it said, uh, baby, baby, come on, baby, come on, baby, come on. But what is, he did, he kept it going, baby, come on, baby, come on, baby, come on. Right. I was like, OK, I'm like, that's nice. I'm sitting in the back seat of the car like, three years later, I got it. <laughs> and I say, I got my equipment. And I was like, well, now I got this, this song. Let me try it. 
and it worked. Um, so at that time, Ghetto House in Chicago was real strong, and everything was still regular house, but at a faster tempo on, with the regular form, four beats, one, two, three, four. What happened was that it was other sounds I put on top of it, so that's how it became a groove. That changed, uh, but me not knowing what the impact was going to happen to the people. Mm. The part that threw everybody off is the baby, 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 baby. I actually did that. I didn't have a uh, sequence at the time, so I had to stand there at the sampler and was pressed it, baby, 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 and I recorded it as is. Mm. Me not knowing that as I played it, everybody think it was going to become just a typical baby come all the way through. That just totally changed the diameter of what was soon to become footwork because the dances back then, we just danced. We didn't have a name for it at that point in time. And when they started hearing the samples chop up like that, they got creative. More they, the more they hear it, the more creative they became. Just when I go to different venues and play it, the same people will come to express, hey, this is what we did off this track. So the samples changed, the chop ups changed, and the form floor now had other sounds added on top of it to create this rhythm. Mm. And so the thing that, that was there was Ghetto Tech and Ghetto House. Yes. And what's particularly interesting about that track and your role in this culture is that you could see one genre form another. Yes. And that's what's really interesting. So what about the sound of Ghetto House or Ghetto Tech left you thinking, I could do something else? Like, what, were you, what did you have in your mind's eye that you wanted to create something new out of that? The amazing part was I wasn't... I didn't have a plan to recreate anything. It was just we are uh, congregated amongst each other, and we complemented each other's tracks. So what I would do was just add other things to it that was available in the drum machine at that time, because all the producers back then was using, uh, before the MPC Studio 3000 became available, the biggest drum machine was rolling our Saturday. And I had that same one. I was the last to get it. It was just, I heard different sounds that I added on to it to say, well, hey, thank you all for introducing me to this. But I was expressing how I felt at that time. And not knowing that I wasn't thinking about trying to stay normal. I was just wanting to just share my life with the music. It, it just exploded. Mm. The Roland. The Roland R70 drum machine was the first piece of um, equipment that you got, but it's become like a staple of your sound. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, how you would use that in the early days? Because I know you got a model that was on display in a store and you didn't get an instruction manual yes. with it. Uh, I walked into the store, the Good Time Center, and they told me, they said, we do have uh, R70s left. So I, I raced to the store. When I get there, uh, the guy said, we don't have any more in, in stock. We don't know when they might come back out with it. We'll have it in, if so, uh, probably three or four more weeks. He said, if you want to, you can uh, take the display bottle. Fine, no problem, I'll take it, because I wanted this machine. Not knowing that he comes back and he says, well, we don't have the instruction manuals to it. And I was like, okay, I'll still take it. When I get home, uh, some things I learned about the R70 um, that I, one thing I did know, then I learned, then what I did learn. When I got home, I plugged it up, and so I started playing with the sounds. So I created this pattern of uh, the bars, was on, uh, one bar, me not knowing that you could stretch the bars. So for years, I played off one bar. That Baby Come On is, was, uh, before I did that, everything was one bar. And what you do to copy that bar and spread it to the next pattern, I didn't know how to do that. So what happened was, as I created this beat, 
I remember creating this beat and reconstructed it from the beginning through every pad. And then I add the other parts on. I did that for like a month, but remembered how I did it. So I'm like, there's a certain way to pattern this. I called DJ Dion. He knew exactly what I was talking about. So he says, you press this button, your CSS pattern copy, if you own one, press two, press enter, and there it will be. I was like, all this time. <laughs> uh, so that stuck with me. So I say, once you learn something, you never forget it. Then when I, years later, like three years later, so I seen somebody else with an R70. So I go dig into the R70 sound, and I'm pressing the buttons. And I'm like, these sounds don't sound familiar for what I have. Somebody said, you can, uh, you can always change the sounds. So I asked, I said, are these the original sounds that's in it? He said, yes. I was like, wait a minute. I put two or two together. When I bought that machine, the world of people that travel through the Good Time Center was actually programming their sounds, and I just adapted what they put in there. And what happened was, like, mind-blowing. I was like, thank you, world, for putting your sounds in this place and let me utilize it. And the, it just took off. And so that's why people like, that's why your sound sounds different from everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I did not know that. That's really taken me by surprise. I thought I knew everything about you. Um, what's, what is so nice about that is that you've quite literally the sound of everyone in Chicago. Yes. Everyone in that we trusted, we never know if it was people from out of the city that came and touched mm. this machine. That's incredible. Yes. OK, another. Um, another element of, of what was there and what was not there. I'd really like to get into how Footwork has managed to have a 15 to 20 year uh, ability to cre grow and create itself as a genre without really any outside influence. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about was the, not so much the demise, but the role that the kind of lack of interest in, in dance mania towards the late 90s had right. with your ability to put music out. Can you kind of set the scene of what it was like in the late 90s around the time that you made Baby Come On and what kind of like local infrastructure was there for you to put your music out in Chicago? Well, when I was in uh, this dance, dance group called House of Matic, um, they hosted the best parties on the south side of Chicago. Uh, we had two sections. We had the west side and the south side. And the DJs was all cool. They was very friendly. And, but House of Matic had this structure to where uh, you could come and hear some of the best tracks. And at that time, Dance Mania was the only place that we had to uh, get records put out from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, on the south side, it was that was very heavy with producing tracks and being able to use that outlet was uh, DJ Dion, DJ Milton, uh, DJ Sluggo, uh, Paul Johnson, um, DJ uh, Stacy Kidd, The West Side, Jam and Jura, Waxmaster, um, this guy named Rick, we call him House Mons, and what was taking place was every time these guys make new tracks, they was able to walk into Dance Mania and give it to the owner, which is Ray Barney at the time, uh, and he was pressing these tracks. So we would hit these tracks in mixes, and we go to the store and buy them. And the opportunity became after I got the R70, it was one day I did a tape called uh, Dasmataz. And Das Mataz had Baby Come On, a uh, song called The Ice Cream Truck, uh, Household, House of Matic. And on the tape, I gave it to DJ Sluggo, and he was like, well, can we, um, he said, I'm going to take this to a different state, and I'm going to sell some of these tapes. 
So as he's writing, that's when cell phones first came popular in the 90s. I was getting phone calls at 3 a.m. in the morning. And he had put the, the phone up to the, the uh, speaker and he said, who made this track? I did. Okay, three more phone calls come there, different tracks. Who made this track? I did. When I come home, can we have a chance to get this out on Dad's Media? Sure, no problem. That's when it first started for me, but uh, it was something else that took place. At that time, we didn't know that Dad's Media was about to collapse. Um, and every time there's a uh, track, a uh, record comes out, it have up anywhere from four tracks to six tracks. And the guy, Ray Barney, haven't heard anything like this, this before. And a couple of other guys was like, well, we don't know how this might turn out to be. So they did 50, uh, they did 100 test press. I got 50 to distribute, and the other DJs got one apiece. And the question was, are you going to distribute this, or are you going to make it a label, put it on a label? And the guy told me no. He was like, I'm not going to chance it. So even though it came out on 100 vinyls, it never got distributed. And a couple of months later to a year later, the whole label just collapsed. Mm. So there was nothing else that we had to utilize other than mixtapes. And with the mixtapes, we had DJs that would make mixes and edit it up on like a, a Tascam 4 track. And a lot of the tracks that I made could end up on these mixes. But what happened was that they had so many tracks in with a long list of tracks that they would only title the tracks and they never put the producer's name on the side. So when I started doing mixes, I was one of the first ones to include the artist and the producer who actually made the, the track so it was able to give the listeners to say, well, we want to hear more of this individual to what a label might want to pick them up. And we just went so many years until like 2000 before we got a chance again. What happened with those 100 test pressings? Because I'd imagine that when you have that really small li limited run of records and a label said, we're not going to put it out, how, how vital do those records become for DJs? Was there like a competitive nature in the scene to have, to have tracks that no one else had? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, back then, uh, we, we called them test press because they had no label, it was just white labels. And if somebody sees it, depending on who you are, some people wouldn't label it, they just leave it plain white. And when they play it, if it becomes, if it's a hot track, the first thing they ask them, who made that track? Did they tell it, did they go back to the record stores, they would find out that the records wasn't pressed. And when it got news that I did the baby come on, all the, the DJs and the other soon to be producers that was DJing was very upset. On top of that, was highly upset. And it's like now some people could walk up and say, Well, I finally got a copy because somebody lost it. And if they do, they like, they 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 were like Whoever lost this record, they're, they're never getting it back. So that record is like a gold mine if it falls in somebody's hand. It's still something floating around that a lot of DJs lost. Uh, Tracksman, uh, DJ Tracksman got lucky and found uh, some that was not distributed in Dance Mania because he used to work for Dance Mania. And when he played, he was like, no way. Nobody's get these, and he got three copies. <laughs> He's a lucky man. Uh, it's, it's so fascinating to think about the microcosm of this culture in terms of how, I say how long it took to spread, but the fact that it took so long meant that the culture could create its own identity independent yes. of outside influence. 
And another part of that being is the fact that you DJed at, at, at very local events, and it was also part of your work. Yes. Could you um, explain to the people how playing as a DJ in a club at the time probably wasn't the same as DJing at like a dance party. Right. And how those two things were quite different and what impact that had on the sound. Okay, with the, uh, I'm a star from <laughs> the, the beginning and before I went to the club. Um, it was at a point in time, even if I didn't have the records, every time I make something fresh, I had it on a cassette tape. So I was able to experiment with the people and inside of these places, um, I considered this the science lab. And every time something come fresh off my brain, I'd make it. And I was coming in, even with a job, with ideas, just spread it out. And I could play a, a track and they, oh, we love this track. But it just, so many of them started coming out to work. I just walked through the party and I smiled. And somebody caught on to it. They were like, well, you catch him smiling. He has something new. And I will play it. The next following two weeks, I have something new. But that scene, it was like so incredible. The, the, the people just love to dance. And these was teenagers to young adults, well, from the ages of 17 to 25, and I just couldn't believe that the 25-year-olds was there. And they knew how to dance. And as that's taken place, it was one story I heard that was mind-blowing. Um, as me playing and the, my spinning techniques, nobody had it like me. And this guy was like, I'm standing outside, and I hear this track playing. Okay, we know that's boo track, but uh, okay, we hear baby come on, but uh, that next track, we never heard that before. But they was listening outside the club because you could hear the music playing, and as the music playing, they could they know the blends. They were like, that's boo, and they would tell people, you got to hurry up, pay. Hey, we can't miss this show because we don't know how long he's going to be on. That went on for years. But when I went in the clubs, when I did the track called 114799, as I go in the club, it's adult club, the, the, the 20 plus. Uh, and they would have like adult entertainment shows and a couple of the, the, the male strippers was dancing off my track. And I was like, wait a minute. So the guy said, he said, you don't know how powerful this track is. Every guy came in there and performed. If it was 10 guys that came and performed within a dance routine, but one track was in every last one of their routines. And so one day they say, well, the DJ that was DJing his name was DJ Disco. And me and her was real good friends, so I walked in the club. He said, oh, yeah. He said, if I let you on, would you play? Said, yeah, no problem. So this one guy asked me, say, hey, Disco, are you going to play tonight? You going to play some juke music in some house? He was like, not tonight. He say, I got somebody y'all need to hear. Only certain people knew who I was. And they said, well, OK, we give you uh, a 30-minute window at this show to where you get to play the music while they dancing. When I played the second track, the people just went berserk. I was talking about they danced so hard to where the club promoter came out and was like, turn it off, <laughs> turn it off, because he thought it was going to start a fight. And the guy told him, said, we got this. What happened next was like I just got requested, but I couldn't take the, the job because I had a, a job. And for every chance we had to play these tracks in these clubs, it just changed my format as well, too, to footwork, that's fine. House. I knew a lot of the older people wouldn't be able to catch the footwork, so I kept producing in between. 
And the tracks had got so good to the point to where it was like, this guy is the ultimate best. So I tell people, I'm, I'm just a normal person. And it was, it, how you do it? It's just from within my heart how I produce. And that's why I tell people to do what you have to do. Watch the, watch the dance floor. That's how you do it. Just watch the dance floor. And create with the dance floor. And then at that time, when it was starting to get a little bit publicity in the States, that's when the music changed. And the, the mission, in other words, was to eliminate the dance music scene. And I never stopped. You never stopped? I never stopped. This is, you, you mentioned there um, you had like a half hour slot and you had to absolutely kill it. And I find it really interesting to take from the ideas of Ghetto Tech and Ghetto House into footwork is that the actual techniques of DJing had an impact on the productions. Yes. Um, very much in the style where um, when Jeff Mills would do The Wizard on air in Detroit, his, his shows were, were half an hour long. So he had to be really, really creative. Yeah and how to play as much music as possible in yep. an inventive way. Um, were you aware when you were DJing, were you thinking about like the DJing te t techniques, like speeding a record up from 33 to 45? Did you have those kind of things in mind when you were making beats? No, um, it was a fast transition for me though. And like I said, uh, it was a nice groovy tempo. But what happened, uh, I just changed with the times by watching other producers uh, in the scene that was progressing to be into footwork. A lot of the dancers really didn't too much like it. Now, techno was, was kind of speedy and catchy, it, but for us to play techno, we had that space to play it as long as possible. But when it came time to the actual dancers, it was like a flop. And the flop was like a mistake that a dance group won off this, take the 33, press the 45, and other DJs decided to say, well, hey, we're going to just speed up the tempo. I was like, something is missing. And I just couldn't make that transition just that fast. And I was like, well, I gave it a try, but I gradually went up. But I had to say, I don't want it to sound so compressed. And um, when it came time to mixing, DJ Tracksman was one of the first ones I actually seen do it with records. As it says, shorten the set, but play more tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, what it is, is the way you format your tracks. Now, it's, some people could just make a track and once you press play, it just goes. There's no uh, breakdowns, there's no drops, there wasn't no, uh, it was just one sequence. The only thing that would change is a sound. Due to uh, the old house music had a format that was plainly sitting there. Intro, it plays. Then it shifts at a different bar. Every time it shifts, when it shifts, you take the record that you actually finna blend, don't let it get to the breakdown. Catch the shift. When you blend it with the shift, it matches. As long as it's a uh, if it's an even bar, it fits perfectly. So once you get that, you could take, I say, a good, uh, within 30 minutes, all dependent, because I could do it now. I could still get 12 tracks in, easy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, it, the formula was sitting right there the whole time. It's just you got to have a creative mind. Mm. As well as um, the DJing techniques, it's a very obvious thing to state. But, but totally state it too, watching dancers. Watching dancers move to your beats informs how you want to DJ, how you want to produce. Can you remember uh, any particular moment at that transistory period between Ghetto House and Ghetto Tech, and you saw something in a dance and thought, oh, this is something totally new. This is something we're going to call footwork. 
what happened was, um, first how it got its name, um, this guy named DJ Waxmaster, he just made a track called Let Me See Your Footwork. We, we didn't care. So the, 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 the listeners started seeing it as it came to the streets, even though we was already doing this dance. So, okay, that's Chicago footwork. What happened was um, all these producers, even Paul Johnson and the rest of them, I was so far in front of them changing. It was this guy named uh, Nick Parnell, and he was a member of House of Matic, and he was beyond the, the dance ability to, he's, as I create, my music, he was creating his dance. And so when we see each other, we basically complimented each other. We could go to a party and the other soon to be footwork DJs and producers watched him. And as they watch him, they would try to make tracks to throw him off. It didn't work. It just didn't work because he had that ear. He would listen and tell him, play it over. And if somebody in the circle danced against him, he would use that track to his ability and just get rid of him. And even the DJs were like, we can't stop him. We just cannot stop him. There's nothing that we could make that would throw him off. So one day, I was like, I got an idea. He said, if you ever pay attention, when you press play before the... Uh, the, the bass kick or the bass drops kick in, I'm already dancing. So he says, uh, let's make a track to where there is no bass kick. And I said, okay, cool, no problem. So we actually test it out. As I'm playing it, this, the track was called Platt Solo. And as soon as I play it, I said, here it go. He just started dancing. Because what he was doing, he was listening to the other sounds. Even if it was uh, a whistle, he would go with the flow of what it was doing. And as he dancing, he's doing all these dances to what you could you can see it as if it was a bass kick, but he was like flowing with the wind. He was just using his element and how he felt in between. And as he's dancing, this one guy, he looks at me and he give me the signal like, and he tells me, when is the beat going to drop? And what he said that I was like, we did it. We did it. And when I told him what the project was, that's when all the DJs was like, creative. Then I was able to throw something in on the next track. That's how the freedom become to become the next version of footwork to where uh, it takes off it, one, two, three, four, one. Then down the line, here come another one. But it all depends on how many bars. So the sound of it to where it's at right now, it was created by dancers to say, well, see if you could catch me. And we just went somewhere else, and the dancers had no other choice but to join the club. Yeah, absolutely. It's a sound for and, and driven by, the, like, the human body. Yes. And that's such, like, a tactile thing. It's just incredible that, 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 that trying to throw off one guy created a genre. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yes. Now, to. these parties that these dancers were at, um, you were often uh, not coming there as, like, you know, the big time DJ. Like yes. You were actually installing the sound systems too. Yes. And you would use that job in order to, to get into the culture and, and, and see things grow. Can you tell me about your work at that period um, with the sound systems and, and running these parties? What I used to do, uh, my regular job, I uh, worked there for 15 years, like at a uh, quick lube, getting dirty, my hands dirty, and dealing with customers as the usual. So as the scene started changing, uh, a lot of, with dance mania folded, mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, the dance groups kind of disappeared, but there was a couple of more that were still around, so they had the ability to go to different park districts in the city and do what they call dance downs, which is competitions uh, of a multiple of anywhere from 10 to 15 dancers in a group competing against other groups. So um, 
the sound guy I was working with, his name is Mr. Homer Cunningham. We have created a, a great relationship, and he liked the way I DJ. So he say, you're the only person that I kind of trust, so I'm going to show you how to uh, work with me and watch over the sound system while I'm leaving. Fine, I hook up the, the sound system. So I was able to walk into these places, and they say, oh, here come RP. And the question is, uh, are you DJing tonight? I'm just here to hook up the sounds. That's it. Oh, uh, we know you got some music on you. Yeah. Uh, so all the music that I was creating that they didn't hear, months at a time, I bring them in. And I do the, I always had to test out the speakers to make sure all the speakers was working. And I tested out with the new tracks and they be like, why you stalling? Why you holding out? What's this? Oh, man. That went on for at least about five years. And in between, I was always able to come in, hook up the sounds, and the kids smile. We know you got some new music. Oh, yeah. And that's when they was able to hear all the new music other than after this, the, the dance competition, whoever the promoter was might have an after party. Are you coming to the after party? Sometime I come. When I come to the after party, all the DJs that was there, that was now coming into the footwork scene, will say, we don't want to spin. Not right now. Can you play? And I was doing it for free of charge. I didn't care. Because I love to hear my music spread it. I just didn't care. And that was the opportunity to keep it going, keep it going, but not knowing what the future was going to bring. It had got to a point to where I would leave my tracks with DJs as the CDs first became real popular. Uh, I would leave the CD on the table, say, here, take this track. It's for you. You can keep it. And the guys wouldn't play it, but they wait till after I leave. And what happened next was the phone calls. When you make this track? How long I had this track? I left you the track like three weeks ago. It was one track that I play, made called Get Em. Get Em was, I just used viol a violin uh, off an of old 60 song. And the rhythm of it, they just fell in love with. They say they actually played Get Em over 12 times, back to back to back, and nobody complained. Like, hey, have a ball. And it just went on until, like, uh, even the dance group scene died out. And when that, when that died out, I was still producing tracks. DJ Rashad was working on um, a cruise line. And he was able to spread it out. Then he was able to go over into Detroit what the ghetto tech sounds was that, and he was able to push it there as well. What was the relationship between, uh, just on that last point, definitely, what was the relationship between Chicago and Detroit? Was it, comp in, the, in this regard with this new sound, was it competitive? Was it quite friendly? Like, was there it even was, a relationship? It was, it was very friendly, and uh, it was a lot of songs that was produced in the early 80s of house music that a lot of people thought that Chicago was dead. It was Detroit. Mm. So they, they had a good bond. Mm. Uh, what built the future relationship was that it was DJ Godfather from Detroit. He was able to go and, I think, to discard and go and find Dance Mania's uh, uh, vault. And he made an agreement with uh, a lot of the producers to come over to Detroit to have those tracks that was lost or licensed to relicense them. Right. And they was going over, everybody went over, Dion, uh, Waxmaster, Rashad, DJ Clint, Sluggo, um, those, was, those was the main ones that went. So, that's what built the relationship mm. between Chicago and Detroit because they always liked the music and they complement. And Detroit was heavy pushers in what Chicago was this, but they had a better and bigger outlet than Chicago. Mm, definitely. Okay.
talked a lot about Chicago and Detroit and back to you. Uh, I remember you, you saying once that in the early 2000s, you just turned the radio off for good. Yeah. Can you tell me why you did that and where, as I know it's a huge question, but what musical and not so musical sounds do you listen out for, for ideas for tracks? I listen to anything before I turned off the radio, mainly to well, uh, soulful music, James Brown, a lot of people that played more that was a band. Because I imagined myself before I became a DJ standing on stage uh, either playing trumpet, drums, bass guitar, or the lead guitar, and I imagined that. So it's those type of songs that I listen to, the, the uh, U2s, um, uh, I knew Phil Collins. Uh, I know you're big on Earth, Wind, and Fire too. That was like yeah thing. Yeah. Um, Pat Benatar, uh, Cindy Lauper, those songs, songs that relaxes me or something that I feel that's a good groove. What kind of made me turn off the radio because I was always looking for, I love creativity. And it was like in the States, as the rap scene came in, and I started seeing a lot of violence being promoted in this stuff. And one day I was watching a video, and I saw, I seen too many videos where there was no creativity. And the artists that was making these songs didn't have nothing to me that was like positive or inspiring to the point to where I said, why well, I'm listening to this? And I just turned off the radio and never looked back. And, but I still got my crates of old music that still inspires me. And they still play on the radio and they still have a lot of ideas to say, oh, I missed that. So it's still so much hidden of inspiration to bring forth the future here in those songs. Bring forth the future is perhaps a really good time to play one of your new tracks. Back yes. to the future, shall we do that? Yes, play And we can talk about the idea of, um, of, of old music still sounding like the future and, and partly from the way that your music's been released. So tell me a little bit about, yeah, this is, you're all in for a treat. We've got three new RP Boo tracks that haven't really been heard out. I see a very happy looking man in the front row. Um, so we've got three tracks, they're all very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one we're gonna play is, is Back From The Future. Can you tell us a little bit about this track before we play it? Well, Back From The Future is, I love the way I named it. Um, years ago, it was told that as I was producing these tracks, people would walk past me and say, you're making tracks, we kind of understand about how much of an impact on these people that everything sounds so ahead of your time. Just I could take a song from wherever it stands and switch it to the point to where people like, we don't have that mind span to create that. So I'm steady hearing this for years. Even now, I still hear, you're ahead of your time. So due to the last two albums I did, I was more like, you know what? Let me come back and talk to the people and let them know what's about to happen. And I was like, made this track. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna call this Back From The Future to let people know I'm still here. But for me to say Back From The Future, you don't know what's at the future only what I produce and what's about to come out until then, you will be still stuck in the past. So I can always go to the future and bring you my ideas and say, here, here you go. But it's being the presence, but it's actually something that I did never create. So I'm giving you my creativity. Great, okay, let's listen to it Back From The Future by, it, by record player Boo. So good. 
to get it on this big system. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I had to just let that completely play out because you were enjoying it so much as everybody else. They're like, it flies to honey. You can hear that bass come in. It's a fantastic piece of music. Thank you, thank yeah. you. So that's a, a, a brand new track from you. Um, I really, now that we're talking about the future, let's talk about some future boo. Right. Um, tell me about the sounds that you've been thinking about and working on when you work on something like this, these like musical and non-musical sounds? Well, the non-musical is super easy. Super easy. I could use my voice to do anything. Uh, sounds of, uh, I, I have an archive of sounds that I haven't even used but been collecting. Sounds of natural just recordings of birds, uh, locomotive signals, horns, uh, that's not even within programs. It's one I have uh, of an actual tornado siren that I never heard anywhere else, but they do have their signatures. In Chicago have one that's so very eerie. It's scary. And with this track right here, uh, even though you hear the uh, Rick James singing, this was more of a concept. I was already making the track, and I was like, let me see what it sounds like with an acapella. And it just stuck there. Just, I sent it out to the labels to say, here, I want you to hear something. Even the labels was like, this is epic from what we've been had. Uh, the sounds, the formats, the patterns of something that was me actually playing it out. Other than just press the button. That's something I always wanted to do, really create with my hands mm. and just take it to another place. And I'm not worried about sounding like somebody else because I know how to get that pattern. You just hold a certain button, press a certain button, and you add it. So that's how a lot of people get stuck. I just wanted to be more free. Um, it's still a couple of reformats within the base that I want to just take it somewhere else. Not too much, but simple, where it's very noticeable. So when it does come out, you might not even hear a voice at all. It might be a little bit more different sounds that's inside of the, um, these packs and these, uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, plugins sounds that I really want to work with. And once I got Ableton pushed to, what I seen in there and what I did and reconstruct, I'm like, I'm in La La Land now. I can do whatever and create. So the world is like, hey, let me show you what I can do and be able to have you all be a part of the future. Because one thing I tell a lot of people, even though footwork started somewhere else and a lot of people at home like, this is ours. No, it's not. Now you all, as listeners, DJs, producers that absorb this, you are a part of the future and are in the book as it comes out. So I appreciate whatever you're doing. You guys are the ones who drive me to do more. And I'm not afraid to explore that. Mm, exactly. When it comes to... Um when, when you were talking there about going into like the science lab of your studio and having this like kind of archive of sounds, are you going out and recording sounds like field recordings yourself? Are you are you sampling yourself playing any instruments? I'm really curious. Do you build your own archive as well as go out and find other sounds? Yeah, I could. Uh, I sample myself, or if I'm outside uh, and I heard it once, knowing I'm gonna hear it again, I always keep my phone handy, and I just press record. Mm. Uh, it's a song I did years ago. Uh, it's called uh, The Yodel. And I just was just playing around and just did something with my voice and recorded it. And nobody knew it. it was my voice. They thought it was an instrument playing. And I was like, hmm, only if you knew that was my voice. And people was like, are you smoking marijuana? <laughs> nah, especially not when I did that. So I, I, I was learned to accept what it is that I do because I used to be very afraid to 
even talk on the track. Now I talk, I say things, I have people say, better have a voice recorder around because with RP Talks, I could give a phrase or something that could be incorporated to other people's tracks and it just goes somewhere else and it's like, I don't use it as to say, well, you just copying my style. I'm just useful to, for others as well. Mm. Speaking of voices, why don't we play one of your other new ones, which sounds if, if very different from the last one. Okay. Why don't we play You Don't Know? Go ahead. Yeah, OK. And for another treat. Oh, and this, this, is, this is one this of your brand new ones. Beautiful. Too. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. We'll let you hear it's it. It's beautiful. Like you, that can 
in these ones. You Um, that's a really an, an emotional piece of music um, and says a lot about what you can do with a human voice yeah. uh, in unexpected ways, um, really putting, there's a lot of conversation that how do you put yourself in the sound, you know? And I think that is a really lovely example of how you can do that in a technical way, in an emotional way. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it re originally, um, how I came with that track, it was supposed to have been, uh, it's still personal, but it was supposed to come out like in Chicago, we have this issue with a lot of um, people that argues amongst each other. So I'm not a talk to them through the music. It was supposed to be a diss track against the uh, people that complain about certain things. Just to try to let them understand, hey, it's bigger than what you expect. I was uh, making a track. I had just come from um, a tour. And as I'm making a track, I normally don't make tracks in front of people. And uh, my mother-in-law was sitting on the side. So my wife was like, he normally don't make tracks in front of people. So that same day, it was, uh, we took her to the doctor. And that same night, we found out she had cancer. So her inspired me to keep pushing and become a better person and told me, say, don't worry about me. If you gotta go to work, you go to work. So I reconstructed the whole track. And there's still some things that I wanna add on to it. But as I listened to it, I was like, she was so inspired because um, she kept her composure. She passed like two months afterwards. And I was like, this is who I am. And I wanted people to just really understand, hey, I like to dance, just I love to hear beautiful music too. So don't keep it in for myself share it with the world. And when I played that and gave it to the labels, the labels was still stuck on that track right now. Mm. It's just saying, we got to have it. Mm. So it's more of joy for me right now. So it's, it's, not a, it's not tears of sadness, it's tears of joy. So I don't have no, no shame of holding things back. I'm just a happy person. And I'm still happy, even though these are tears of joy. And that track right there, is be able to be, be, helps me become an artist. I like to dance, just I want people to understand when you come from the rubbish sound that creates footwork and you elevate, some people just think uh, it's still dance music. But once you open your heart, your mind, and your ears, you start to hear the beautifulness comes out to what you will understand, say, this person is not only human, we understand where they come from, just we hear the artists in them. And the people are the ones who taught me how to become that artist. So that's why I love that track so much. Thank you for sharing that. Right. Um, it's, it's, there's so much autobiography in your, in your, in your music. Um, and I think that's a really incredible example of that. So thank you very much for sharing that. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe on that, on that idea of putting yourself in the music and how the music changes, um, what we, I mean, we've joked about being back from the future, mm -hmm. right? What do you think 
will happen to, fu to footwork sound in the near future? Because we were discussing this kind of briefly before, how there's definitely an older sound that is very like, organic and sample-based and has a lot of funk and soul yeah. and jazz in it. And there's this newer style of footwork that the Jalens and the younger crew are making that is very digital, very metallic sounding, feels more like about a headspace as well as just like dancing for your feet. Right. What do you think about that change in the sound that maybe some people aren't thinking about the dancers first maybe and they're thinking about creating some other kind of atmosphere? It's because a lot of, a lot of these upper cover producers, and I could take Jalen for example. Uh, when I first heard Jalen, Jalen was a person that became who she was by being herself. And when I first heard her, it made me think about where I used to be at. And she was able to, I thought about saying, well, this is a person who, ha who has a chance because I could hear something totally different. And she was connected through a group called BOTC. And I know that whole squad. And I was like, she's beyond. I say, this is an opportunity to be able to teach somebody and talk to them and lecture them to push them ahead. Uh, one thing I learned about this business is that once you become a uh, creator of something and the world catches it, it don't last forever for that person. So we, in order for it to leave a legacy, you have to push it and teach other people, and Jayla was one of the first ones. She wasn't the person to really use samples. And I gave her a task to do, and she completed this task. But she was able to do with the samples. It still sounded good. I just told her, just be yourself. And she started getting these other software as a program because I still had the r mm. Utilizing what I have. And my creative mind was limited with the R70 as well as the sap because it has short, limited time. Uh, so as I started listening to Jalen, I started hearing how far she can go. Other DJs and producers, same thing, far as they could go. Rashad was very good at going beyond, mimicking, but going and just using other sounds. And what I have gradually caught on to with a lot of other producers, even in house music, they have this opening to where it can just go beyond, but it's just on the producer how they feel. So what I see a lot of footwork producers worldwide is just ongoing, 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 ongoing. No stop, no stopping, no stopping. And what sounds are they using? I don't care. Why? Because they are very enthused to keep going. You can make all type of sounds, compact sounds, and create new sounds. That's, even though all sounds been here, it's just exposing them. And the future of the sound to be, is, is ongoing. There is no, is, there's no stopping it. Mm. No stopping it. And I know there's no stopping it. And the, the amazing part of, I'm still active in it, and know I have, knowing I have a lot of help to keep me going and to be enthused and to create. And what I do, it helps others as well. So it's like a magnetic force recycling energy. And as long as there's ears, there's forever music. <laughs> I like that sentiment a lot. Um, on, on that note, as, as perhaps my last question, out of a, a, really, a really good, like, hearty talk that we've had today, I really appreciate it. Um, what I think a lot of people, when they're familiar with your sound, uh, there's been a long introduction to your work by releasing a lot of older material mm -hmm. over a long period of time. 
Uh, and now that you feel like there's a really strong body of older work out there, people are familiar with it, how does it feel now to, in, to come from a, a scene where there wasn't really, you know, there wasn't really labels to, to, to put your records out, um, you've been making music for like over 20 years, like more than a generation. How does it feel now to like be on labels who are actively releasing the music that you make right now? Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's so amazing. And I learned a lot of things within the, the industry itself. And one of the hardest, a lot of people think for an artist that it's easy. Um, but I had to learn to shift myself and learn how to relax. And I thought I would never get a chance to relax. It took me three, year, three, three and a half years. But in that relaxation time, that's when I was, ah, oh, now I can really do the work. Now I can really explore. And one of the things I learned about in this business, if you put on a good show, and it's, I'm not coming in here cocky. I know who I am. My name is Cave in Space. I've seen DJs and producers come in with a snotty attitudes. And my name is whatever, and think they deserve the world. Huh? Whatever. I had to learn to give and play like it's my last show. Because I don't, I don't know how long I might be here. And the thing is, a lot of the, the, the festival vendors or promoters be in one place. When they hear me, my job is to be able to put on this good show to where I don't need a record coming out. And it's, it's starting to happen. But that's how I feel. Just I always have something more to give them on the music. It doesn't stop. I know how I got here, so it says, whatever you do to get you to where you need to be at, never forget how you got there. So music, that will never stop. Working with the labels, good communication. You gotta have good communication. Festivals and tours, knock them out. <laughs> Talk with the people, embrace the people, uh, motivate the people to become you could use the motivation in anything. It's not only music, it's because everybody has a, a hidden talent and some type of art that's within themselves. And that right there is what I try to do most to bring out with people. And as it happens, I absorb it and it keeps me going more. And with that being said, I see so much of a great future the part I had to realize is that I can't paint that perfect picture. Just everything that has happened to me that I thought about, it's like 10 times bigger than what I imagined. So I just take it day by day, explore, and be very thankful. I'm very thankful to, to my higher creator to say without that good spirit, I couldn't be where I'm at talking to you guys. So I just tell people just love, love yourself, love your family, and just humble yourselves. And everything that's out here is so, the world is beautiful. You people are beautiful. And I'm just loving talking with you guys. And who knows what the next place I might be at, what's the next thing I might do. It's just I know that you guys believe, and I couldn't get there without you, so I believe in you as well to keep me strong. R.P. Boo, thank you very, very much You're for welcome. talking with us today. <laughs>